Warriors Recon. Today we're delving back into Army National Guard combat field studies and speaking with historian Major Brian Fultonson of the Wisconsin Army National Guard and how the Wisconsin Army National Guard uses the state's rich history to develop its leaders in the formation. Sir, for those of us who have not met you or spoken with you before, would you mind giving us a brief introduction? Yeah, I am Major Brian Fultonson. Um, I am currently the Deputy Director of Public Affairs for the Wisconsin National Guard, but I've been a historian of the Wisconsin National Guard for the past 12 years. And uh, my background, civilian background is as a historian, and I worked for 19 years for a history consulting firm become, before coming over to the Guard full time. Um, I start, I've been in the Guard for 31 years. I started out in the Minnesota Guard. I moved to Wisconsin. I was uh, in an infantry unit for 20 years, and I was a platoon sergeant and a first sergeant deployed to Iraq with uh, the 1st Battalion, 128th Infantry with the 32nd Infantry Brigade Combat Team, uh, the, the Red Arrow, and uh, that, was a, that was a good experience. And, uh, and then I uh, transitioned to the officer side and put those civilian skills to work uh, doing history for the Wisconsin National Guard, and it has been a great experience. Wow, that's uh, certainly a diverse career, and uh, an infantry background going into a history position is something uh, I definitely, I definitely feel you on there. So, so, uh, so infantry people, you can branch out, and you can use <laughs> so, uh, it can be done. Outstanding. So, what uh, what role does a historian play in the modern army? Like within the Army National Guard, within the Army as a whole, what what does a historian really do, and how does it affect the the, the regular formation? Uh, there's, there's several different things a historian can do. The first thing is operationally, as you know, units deploy, they need to collect the documents that they created during their deployments. They need to collect their operations and their after action reviews and their mission reports and various things. So, so when the unit comes back and uh, what it actually did is recorded because history is not does not exist if you don't have the documents and the to show what actually happened and so for people to piece together a story. And uh, so it's very, uh, historian coordinates that within their states, they coordinate with the units to collect that material and uh, or ensure that the material is then properly, um, or in theater, make sure the material is sent to the proper uh, um, places to where it needs to go so it can get collected. and. Uh, and uh, then all this material is rolled up and historians many years from now look at it, they build their historical products, they tell the stories of what happened and they can draw certain lessons from that. And uh, for instance, when we talk about Dawn of the Red Arrow later, I looked at the actual World War I operational records collected by the 32nd Division in France and they had, they had every staff section, every order, all the awards and there's 120 boxes of that. I was able to actually look at those documents and then help build the actual story of that division uh, when we were doing our World War I commemoration campaign a couple of years ago. Within the uh, state deployment uh, of the National Guard, there's various um, important lessons to learn. Uh, quite often, the state has done these missions before. Uh, certainly not the current mission sets uh, with COVID-19, but, uh, you know, there's been civil disturbances, there's been flood, flood responses, hurricane responses. These missions have happened before, and a uh, historian can look back at those previous missions, draw up lessons learned, draw up how the media portrayed the guard for that situation, um, and then present um, context to the commander to help while they're forming their current plan. Uh, it could be that will certainly help the commander make a more informed plan, maybe a plan with a little bit more perspective. Um, and then um, can, you don't always consider everything when you're in the heat of the moment. If you just take a step back, look at it from a different historical angle, um, you can make, the, make some uh, decisions going forward that could benefit your mission at hand. So a historian can have a very important immediate operational role with the commander. Uh, if, if they're properly utilized that way. And, um, and then finally, the historian helps uh, maintain the history of the organization. Uh, people have pride in every organization they're in. And if you actually know what uh, the organization did, it's easy, that's really easy to grab onto. And soldiers, when they understand that, hey, 32nd Division in World War I was you know, kind of rude, 
they were phenomenal. And then if you look at what they did in World War II and uh, their Berlin crisis called up, they, the 32nd Division of the Wisconsin National Guard and the Michigan National Guard has responded really well to uh, in, in its mission of supporting the U.S. Army as a uh, combat reserve. So having soldiers something to gravitate to that they understand with the, with the uh, units that they serve, it helps build pride and, you know, people want to be part of something important and something real and something well uh, with, with some, with some uh, gravity to it. And that really helps the commander communicate that message. Uh, say, hey, these people have done this. Look at how, how awesome they were. We got to continue that. And it's a lot easier to uh, kind of embrace the suck. Um, if you <laughs> I, I think that's that's pretty awesome. And and that does kind of lead us into what, what would be my next question. Uh, so for other unit historians out there, uh, you know, what other ways are there for unit historians to take their unit's history and influence the, the operations and the current activities of their, their unit? Well, I've done, as a historian, I've done several things um, with our commands and at the operational level. First is when units deploy, they need to collect all of their records and maintain them. Uh, it says by regulation they are to do that. And it's several, there's several reasons for doing it. One is it takes care of soldiers. Uh, you get a soldier 10, 15 years after the deployment, they're trying to get, a, you know, pursue a VA benefit or some other action that, you know, that because of their service, uh, this helps establish their timeline, their location. Uh, this is important information that uh, that uh, that is needed to establish the proper, you know, the proper criteria for these now veterans to receive those benefits and to get what they have truly earned, and uh, to you know, and to accurately tell the story so the proper adjudication can happen. So it's a personnel protection issue that you can take care of your soldiers long after the deployment and uh, commanders, you know, when you speak to them that way, they, okay, I get that. I need to take care of my troops. And uh, so therefore we're going to put some emphasis into this. And um, the other aspect of collecting materials from these deployments is so later historians and later soldiers can understand what happened there. Um, Dawn of the Red Arrow could not have happened if, um, I was not able to go to the National Archives, look at 120 file boxes of records of the division from World War I. I looked at, you know, I looked at personnel reports, I looked at awards, I looked at operations orders, I looked at after actions reviews, and I got to know some of the depth and the flavor and the activity of the division and how it grew, more importantly, how it grew at the time. It was really rough and raw when it was in the Alsace when they first entered the trenches. And you can see the evolution of training and the emphasis of uh, on, um, working out processes at the command level and the staff level so battalions could be effective and then how regiments could be more effective and then how the division could use all of these pieces together. And you actually study the three, the major battles that the division fought in and you can see that the work went in and then you can see on the outcome of the battle that uh, you know things went a lot easier or the division was able to be a lot more flexible and scalable and deployable within the battle space. And uh, to see how that evolution happened um, was uh, can create a great learning lesson today as units train to deploy and to do larger scale um, endeavors, you know, incorporate a battalion into a uh, into a new formation, and you know, there's always a growing pain. How did they? How did they look at it back then? And you can see it's a lot of work, and um, and the ability to tell that story. Um, uh, is a uh, is uh, you no. Know, it's part of not reinventing the wheel, and it's an important aspect of that. And um, then also, we if we no one maintains the records, how can we tell the story? And how can we know the great service that those soldiers did? How can we continue to impart that pride and impart that knowledge and, uh, within the force as 10, 20, 30 years from now? So, so. <laughs> Having that material collected to show what what the unit did is, is very important, and that's another thing that commands need to understand when they deploy. Now, um, more direct to that is within current operations, like for a domestic operation here in the state, like an emergency, or you know, we can look at what have we done before to respond to this. 
Um, we, what have we done with, well, done before with a civil, dis or civil disturbance or a flood or some other missions we've had? Because a lot of missions we've done before, and uh, there's different, their the community had different reactions to them depending on the situation. Um, how can we learn from that to, for the commander to make a more informed or have some perspective uh, when he or she makes the decisions to, uh, to um, build a plan to address a mission that we've been given. So um, a historian can be really good at uh, helping a commander provide an informed, thoughtful perspective uh, while they consider how they're going to address a problem. And uh, just part of that larger um, um, intellectual challenge and intellectual thoughtfulness that uh, we want commanders to have and increasingly more the army would like you know even junior leaders to have is to uh, you know think about this a little bit think of the broader picture and then make decisions based upon that and history can be a very valuable tool with regard to that yeah absolutely i i know uh we've mentioned before that you know a lot of these guard units out there this isn't the first time they've done these civil support missions they've done these these same sort of flood supports or natural disaster support or even you know in a time like today you know supporting in in case of some sort of medical emergency you know why would we reinvent that if we've done this before a uh, unit historian can find that information and present it to a commander uh, to make a more effective plan. It's a great point. Um, but again, some missions we've never done before, like last Tuesday, we supported election poll working in Wisconsin with 2,500 Wisconsin National Guardsmen. Um, you know, the majority of election volunteers in our state are within that very vulnerable population to uh, COVID-19. And uh, we, there's a need for backfill to ensure a safe election within the state. And uh, we... You know, we put guardsmen, we brought them in, we trained them, trained them up to the standard, and they were distributed out to the state as county clerks saw fit. But uh, there's going to be some important lessons uh, with regard to that, because there was a new, unique mission. No one else has ever done it. So uh, we're going to gather uh, material for that and, you know, look at, we'll look at the after actions, we'll look at the orders, we'll look at some, you know, how things went right and went wrong, because you never know. Maybe some other state will have to do this type of mission again. And big lifts of work may not have to be done if uh, if this can be written up and uh, kind of examined and see what was right, what went wrong, and uh, it'd be make, make it more of a template rather than inventing it from whole cloth. So that's another, that's a thing that we're looking at um, here from a, uh, or we'll be looking at here with from a historian point of view. Yeah, absolutely. So can you tell us a little bit about, um, you know, NCODP or ODP programs and how you use uh, Dawn of the Red Arrow with those? Uh, we've made we made the, uh, the, the documentary available, of course, and uh, there's there's units out there that have used this as for an NCODP or an ODP to create and spark discussion. Um, for our staff ride, which uh, we hope to do this November, um, we are going to... Uh, the participants in it will brief a piece of doctrine on a particular piece of terrain and we'll address and look at that at the historical lens of what ac actually happened there. And uh, we're bringing a videographer along and we're going to film that and we're going to turn it into kind of an educational product to bring the staff ride home because only 10 people get to go, but we have 10,000 soldiers and airmen. Um, so we want to be able to get more bang for the buck. So create some some learning products that company commander can sit his lieutenants and his uh, senior NCOs down. You know, let's look at uh, how we do these these principles of doctrine, and then they can have a discussion on that, and uh, you know, get something uh, really worthwhile and valuable um, from from these soldiers getting this great opportunity, but then also um, to bring part of that battlefield back home, and then they can see where these uh, where that group doctrine was actually implemented on a battlefield by soldiers of their unit. So Major Fulton, what is uh, Dawn of the Red Arrow and how does the Wisconsin Army National Guard use it to shape its leaders? Uh, Dawn of the Red Arrow is a couple year commemoration campaign that we had to recognize the service of 15,000 Wisconsin National Guard soldiers who answered the call for World War I. Uh, it was to recognize the 100th anniversary of that event. 
And uh, a key thing about the National Guard of any state in World War I is um, that was the first time the National Guard was used uh, after the adoption of the uh, National Defense Act of 1916, National Defense Act of 1916, when the Guard became the combat reserve of the United States Army. That mission has evolved a little bit since then, but the, the concrete bottom line of the Guard supporting the Army happened at that time, and World War I was the first time that was really implemented at that massive scale. And, um, and then the, a lot of the units in our state the names of the units, like the 127th Infantry, the 128th Infantry, the 32nd Infantry Brigade Combat Team, they come from World War I. Those names came about um, at that time. And it recognizes the, that key piece of history in those, form of those formations and throughout the state, because every unit in the state went as part of the 32nd Division, except for three for the 42nd Division. Um, but uh, and a lot of those units today are now part of some other formation in our state. They're not part of the Red Arrow, but they all come from the same place. So we all share this history. And it's a way to connect our force uh, with each other uh, because there's good, healthy competition between the various uh, brigade and battalion elements within our state. <clears throat> Excuse me. Now, so Dollar Red Arrow has several components and a social media component where we did like on this day 100 years ago. Uh, you know, on the same 100 years ago, the Guard mobilized for service or fought in this battle, or the community supported their Guard unit in this way. And it just kind of recognized the little pieces of, of the history. Uh, we compiled an a anthology, um, a book of about 132, 35 pages. Wow. And uh, that was vignettes of just different aspects of the deployment whether it was the preparation at home, whether it was uh, training, whether it was in France, and you'd find vignettes in that, like the first two females to earn the Silver Star in the entire U.S. Army were nurses attached to the 32nd Division during the Second Battle of the Marne. So that story is in there, and there's just other different interesting things that the division did um, that, uh, you know, just kind of kind of fun, of fun little research projects as a historian. And then the... Uh, culminating activity was the 84-minute uh, uh, documentary we made here in-house. Uh, we got a really talented NCO who knows he's a self-taught videographer. You know, and we gave him a pile of history, gave him a script, and he ran it to ground and put it together in a, uh, in a pretty compelling uh, documentary that's available on YouTube for free because we cannot create you know, DVDs for that. Um, so anyone can watch it, and uh, it tells the entire story of the 32nd Division in World War I. And uh, what was really fun about that as a historian, um, I went to the National Archives. I found, you know, five, six, seven hundred photographs of the division in World War I, found two and a half hours of film of that era. So when you're looking at this documentary, the actual photos you see are division soldiers in France at that time, and the and the in the film that we incorporated it into it are you know the same people, um, and so it's not you know we about seventy five percent of the film is actual true to the time and the people um, that it talks about. You know, there's not a lot of filler in there of just you know you watch some documentaries you'll see the same. The same bomb falling out of the same bomb bay doors uh, in from documentary to documentary to documentary. We have very little of that. So it's very historically accurate. Like, for instance, we have a uh, sermon of a chaplain. Um, and we actually have the actual sermon that he wrote. We actually have the film of the time he actually gave that sermon. And we put those two together. You know, that's kind of some of the historical accuracy that we sh that we really uh wanted to incorporate into the film. And, That's incredible. Uh, so we had the audience for this was many. Um, we wanted to especially bring this out to the whole state of Wisconsin because it was the communities of the state that built the Wisconsin National Guard that, you know, the city of Sheboygan had Company C, 2nd Wisconsin Infantry, which became Company C, 127th Infantry. That unit had been there a long time. Those are the people of that, that city that came together. And then they that city offered up that unit to the Wisconsin National Guard for World War I. And that happened 72 times uh, throughout, um, throughout the state. 
And uh, so to show cities that, hey, this is, you know, you've always been supporting us. Um, you've always been coming and sending your people off to uh, serve in the Wisconsin National Guard. And that's important today as we continually deploy units overseas. And we do get the question occasionally, you know, why are you deploying the National Guard? You've never done that before. No, we've done it in World War I. We did it in World War II. We did it in 1961 for the Berlin Crisis. We've done it in the Persian Gulf War. And we're, do we're doing it now again. But the, uh, the Wisconsin National Guard has responded repeatedly as the primary combat reserve of the United States Army. So that's an important uh, point to share with uh, communities within our state. Um, within our force, um, it's in, Dawn of the Red Arrow is important um, in that we use it to communicate to our newest soldiers. Um, this is where this is where you're going to. These are what this is what the unit you are going to join has done, and you are just you are another piece in that long legacy of that unit. And you have, you know, you have a standard to live up to, and you have some footsteps to follow in as you blaze a new trail forward. And uh, one exciting thing we've done with material for this is, first of all, during their RSP training, they see Dawn of the Red Arrow. It's I presented it to RSP units, and uh, and uh, they only they learn where they're coming from. And then when they're done with basic training and they're done with AIT, they come back to a final RSP drill, and they have a patching ceremony, and they get the patch that they're going to wear, and it's whether it's a thirty second. IBCT, the 157th Maneuver Enhancement Brigade, the 64th Troop Command Brigade, you know, those are all units that have, have a history to Dawn of the Red Arrow, and uh, they learn a history of that patch, and they know what that means to wear that patch, what is the sacrifice um, that the soldiers before them made to create that patch and create the heritage behind it, and uh, so they, they have some pride going into the unit that they belong to. That's pretty incredible. So you use this project not only to to build that sense of unit pride with your current serving formation, but to work to to build kind of a collective memory with the the local community as to how how often the 32nd and the Wisconsin National Guard has has served locally and internationally. And then with your brand new soldiers before they even get to their unit, they're imbibed with this sense of of, of unit history and unit lineage. It's it's a pretty amazing program that I think it's it's pretty unique at anywhere in the Army National Guard. Cool. Yeah, uh, there have been, you know, patching ceremonies are kind of, you know, they're being picked up around the rest of the country on we certainly, you know, hey, this is a great idea, let's do it. But we're, we're incorporating the history piece a little extra hard because, uh, you know, we got that material available and, you know, units in our state got a great history that they, that the soldiers in it need to know. Outstanding. Well, Major Fulton, thanks again for coming out and, and sharing how the Wisconsin Army National Guard uses its long and storied history to educate and build leaders in its formation. So, um, no, this has been a great experience. Um, I love talking about Don the Red Arrow. It's a really great project. Um, if you want to see the documentary, it's available at our Don of the Red Arrow YouTube page. And um, we also have a Dawn of the Red Arrow website, which a link to the video. It also has a link to a number of photographs and smaller videos we did. It also has a link to the 135 page uh, anthology that, uh, or ebook that we, uh, that we created. And uh, so that's the best spot to go see all some of these products that we have made.